right now. We're all right. W welcome, welcome to uh, to the Bible Success Seekers Bible Study. We are here in Tampa, Florida, live in studio with our studio audience. I always wanted to say that. Okay, <laughs> um, but we're here live um, in Tampa at our office and just want to welcome you on YouTube, welcome to you on Zoom. Hopefully this is going to be a blessing to you. Um, the name of this Bible study, we titled it on YouTube or we titled the thumbnail. Um, you can't be trusted, but the title of the video is you'll never have confidence in less. And so um, the reason I'm creating this video is because a lot of people have asked me, they said, Myron, um, you have like you have a level of certainty that's unlike anything that I've seen before. And is that something that you teach? <laughs> I'm like, uh, it's not really something I teach, but I can tell you why I have the level of certainty that I have. And the reason I have the level of certainty that I have is because I've got this book and it tells me what's gonna happen. It has a lot of if then go to statements. Some people call them conditional promises. And so if you do this condition, then God has made this promise. And so what I'm gonna do with y'all today I'm gonna share with y'all some more. We talked about Abraham last Friday when I did the Bible study on get out. And today we're gonna to kind of pick up where we left off. So, so Abram, I'm gonna give you a little background. Abram, uh, Abraham's name was Abram before his name was Abraham, right? And the name Abram means high father or exalted father. And he was, um, when he was 65 or 75 years old, God came to him and said, hey, if you will leave, if you will leave, your country, uh, your kinfolks, and your father's house, and go to the place I'm going to show you, he said, um, I will bless you in ways you can't bless yourself. I'll make you something you can't make yourself. I'll take the source of your shame and turn it into the source of your fame. I'll take the source of your pain and turn it into the source of your power. He says, I'm going to bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's a mighty powerful promise. Well, lo and behold, Abraham, Abram did what he said, right? He left. And so many amazing things happened after he left. One of the things that tells us in the very next chapter, in fact, I'm going to read it to you so you know that I'm not just making it up. So that was in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 13, it says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, uh, he and his wife, and all that he had with him. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. Um, and then it talks about the journey that he took. But the reason I bring that to your attention is because I know a lot of followers of Christ have a hard time with wealth and they have a hard time with the word rich and they don't like the word rich and they don't like the word wealthy and they don't like to think about money. Um, but it's a Bible word and I don't have to be afraid of it if it's in the Bible and it's not in the Bible. It didn't say Satan was very rich. It didn't say, it didn't say that Nebuchadnezzar was very rich. It didn't say, it didn't say that Pharaoh was very rich. It says Abram, Abram, Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. It, it didn't just tell us that he was rich. It told us how rich he was. He was very rich, right? And um, and, and it didn't just tell us how rich he was, it told us how he was rich. He wasn't just rich in a godly heritage, he was rich in cattle and silver and gold. Now, I am not implying, nor am I stating, that uh, God, God wants everybody to be rich. That's not what I'm stating, I'm not, I, I can't, that would, be, that, would, that would be an incorrect statement. But it's not an incorrect statement to say that abundance is, is God's design for God's children. That is not a misstatement, that's not a... That's, I'm not stretching the truth at all, and I, I, I see it not just in one place in the Bible, but throughout Scripture, and people will argue that Jesus is poor. Uh, Jesus was poor, so you should be poor. I, I don't know where they get the idea Jesus was poor, for one, um, and if he was poor, why did he have a treasure? I don't know any poor people that have a treasure. I, I, I don't know. Maybe there are some poor people that have treasures. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not intending to be obtuse or argumentative, but we have to think when we read the Bible. We can't just read it and then think all the stuff that other people told us to think when we're reading it. Or otherwise, we're not going to learn anything, right? So, so we see that in chapter 13. In chapter 14, um, um, in chapter 13, at the end of chapter 13, Noah, who is Abram's, uh, not Noah, Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, they, who grew up with Abraham, his employees and Lot, Abraham's employees got in a little tiff about, no, no, my cows were here first. No, my cows were here first, right? And Lot, Abraham says, here, let's don't do that. By the way, this is a good way to solve a dispute. This is a biblical way to solve a dispute, by the way. Um, Abram, Abram's, Abram said, here, here like, let don't, let's don't let there be anything between me and you. We're brothers. We're related. We're family. We're kinfolk. So here's what I'm going to do. You look in the, to the north, the south, the east, and the west. Pick whatever you like, and whatever you pick, 
I'll take what's left over. Wait, what? Now, Abraham had the right to pick, right? But he didn't do that. He said, I'm going to give you what you want. I'll take what's left over. Why did he do that? Because Abraham had the confidence to know that wherever he went, he was going to be blessed, right? So, like, I don't need a particular plot of land to be blessed. I don't need a particular job to be blessed. I don't need a particular person or group of people to accept me to be blessed. He said, the blessing of God is on my life because I am yielded to the king. So, so, so he said, so that's what happened in chapter 13. Well, in chapter 14, uh, Lot, in chapter 13, Lot decided he was going to go down towards Sodom and Gomorrah because that was the, where the plains were well watered. There was lots of grass. His cattle could grow. His business would do well. So he picked the well watered plains towards Sodom. Well, what happens next? Um, what happens next is um, uh, Ketalomar and four other kings make war with the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. And so one of the things we have to do when we're reading the Bible, we have to understand the context and we have to understand the time and what was going on in the times when the th things were written. And, and like we, when we think of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah, we think of cities like Tampa's a city or like Augusta's a city or like, or like Miami's a city. But it, they weren't cities like that. They were kingdoms. They were kingdoms that had walls around them that had kings that ruled over them. So the word city and the word kingdom in the Old Testament oftentimes could be interchanged. Okay, a lot of people don't realize that. Like, and how do I know that? Well, because Sodom had a king and Gomorrah had a king. And if they weren't kingdoms, they wouldn't need a king. They didn't have mayors, they had kings. Okay, so just want to make sure we understand that. So what happened, Ketalomar and four of his buddies said, you know what? The, the, the uh, plains towards Sodom are well watered. Let's go wage war with them and take their land. So they went down and they waged war and they, they, uh, there were some slime pits and a lot of the people got killed in some slime pits. And then they took the kings of Sodom and the, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, took them hostage but Lot was with him. And Abram said, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> like, like I want you, I want you, this is a guy, this is a guy who's at least 75 years old. He said, no, 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 not my nephew. Now, you, I, I, no, 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 that ain't how we do it around here. Like, you might have done that over there and over there and over there, but this ain't that. And I ain't the one. So Abram came home, got 318 of the servants that were born in his house. He said, all right, guys, I know y'all been working in the field, but here's what we got to do. We got to go to war now, right? Sometimes it's time to go to work, but sometimes it's time to go to war. And see, a, a lot of people would like to act like there's never a good time to, for war, but I would, ha I, would, I would beg to differ and say that it is impossible to have peace unless you are willing to have war. Oh, snap, did he say that? It is impossible to have peace unless you are willing to have war. I learned that lesson from my parents when I was growing up, went to school here in Tampa, and uh, went to Twin Lakes Elementary School. My family moved here from Pennsylvania, and compared to people in Florida, we talked funny, right? Um, and we talked really funny. And uh, we came from like Western Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania, and we had a Western Pennsylvania coal mine accent. What are you guys doing then once in a while? You know, that's how we talked when we came down here to Florida. And, and they used to say, why y'all talk so funny, right? So, so they used to pick on us every day. And like one day we were getting ready to go to school and we knew the entire bus, like we had to ride the bus to school. All the kids on the bus picked on me and my five little brothers because we talked funny. We talked funny. I had a brace on my leg. They didn't like us for any reason whatsoever. Like, we're like, Dad, we don't want to go to school. These kids are always picking on you. My dad said, I'll tell you what. <laughs> he said, the first one that touches you, I'm in the sixth grade now, you got to understand this. He said, you grab them by the collar and you beat them about the head and shoulders and they will leave you alone for the rest of your life. And you know what I thought? I thought these kids are crazy. My parents are crazy. Everybody's crazy. I'm stuck in the middle. So sure enough, I got to the bus stop. And... Um, this girl tried to hit me in my, and I said to my dad, but what if it's a girl? He said, I don't care nothing about that. Like, he wasn't, my dad wasn't playing now. My dad wasn't playing. Oh, that's exactly how he said it. <laughs> that's exactly how he said it. And, and I've never done this since, but I did it that day because I was way more scared of him than I was of them. And this girl came up, tried to hit me with a stick. I grabbed her by her collar, pat 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 And then this other girl, she was a giant. I mean, she was bigger than me in the sixth grade. And she grabbed me, and me and the other girl, we were kind of wrestling with the stick, and it hit the tall girl, Mary, hit her in the head. She said, why you hit me in my head? Her voice was deeper than mine. Like, boom, boom, I'm bouncing on the ground, right? They start kicking me. 
I'm like, this is cr-. like, I felt like I was in a really bad movie. So I'm now, I was beating up a girl and then I got beat up by a girl. This is like the worst day of my life, right? And so, and, and she did get a lick on my arm with that stick. And I had a big old knot on my arm. We ended up going to the principal's office. And went, Do you know those kids never said another antagon- antagonistic word to us ever? I was like, wow, I thought my dad was crazy, but maybe he's a prophet, right? Like, like and, 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 and I'm going to tell you a big problem we have in the United States of America, okay? A big problem we have in the United States of America is too many crazy people have big mouths and too many sane people are scared to speak up because they're afraid that they might get canceled, right? So free speech is under attack. I'm going to tell you something about free speech. Free speech ain't free. Somebody's going to have to pay a price. And, and, and when you take away free speech, now you're also taking away freedom of thought. And if you look at any dictatorship that's ever been created, it's been created on a lack of free speech and a lack of free thought. And so you have to understand in our modern day politically correct society where they're making, they're forcing people to capitulate to the opinions of other people, okay, I, I wasn't going here this morning. I don't even know how I got here, but we're already here. So I'm chasing a rabbit and, and that rabbit, I ain't going to let that rabbit get away. So, so, so they, what they're doing is they're forcing people to capitulate. But I'm going to tell you something about truth. Truth does not require a consensus. Truth does not need to silence error in order for it to exist. Light does not need for darkness to go away in order for it to exist. But darkness needs light to go away in order for it to exist. And I think that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be the light of the world. And we're not supposed to light our candle and put it under the bed of rest or under the bushel of work, but we're supposed to put it on the table so it gives light to everybody that's in the house. And the the problem is because, because people with all these crazy ideas have the biggest mouths, we don't say anything. I'm going to tell you something. For instance... I'm going to make a statement first. So, like, I was born, y'all don't know this, maybe some of y'all know this. I was born in Tampa. I was born in Clarify Hospital. Clarify Hospital was a segregated hospital. I could not be born in Tampa General because my mom and dad were black. Black folks had to be born in a black folks hospital. White folks had, I know that's kind of, y'all are saying, wait, what? So, so, so I am a person, my life has been negatively impacted by discrimination, segregation, racism, and all that. Every day of my life has been impacted by that satanic thinking, okay? Every step I've taken has been with a reminder of that satanic thinking, because I have a long leg brace on my leg. People here, can you see it? Like, like that has impacted my life. But even though that is true and racism is evil, if we are going to have freedom, People, racist people have to have a right to be racist. What? What did he just say? Did I just say that? Here's why. Mark Twain said, never argue with an idiot. They will bring you down to their level and beat you with experience. Like, so, so I don't argue with racists. Like, do your thing. As, as long as you're not trying to do harm to me or anybody around me, any innocent people around me, do your thing. Be a racist. Me spending time arguing with you would be like me going outside and seeing some guy standing out just right outside saying, the sky is green and the grass is blue. Don't y'all hear me? The sky is green and the grass is blue. I don't know why y'all think the sky is blue and the grass is green. The sky is clearly green and the grass is blue. How much time would you spend arguing with that person? Zero. Why? You would just acknowledge this is a crazy person and keep on going. Right? There are some arguments that do not require or even um, deserve a response. You just let them go be idiots on their own. Like, to argue with a racist over racism validates their point. But you know, one of the things that gave racism, segregation, Jim Crow law, and all of that, the, the power that it had for hundreds of years in the United States of America, watch this now, it was against the law to speak out against it. Oh, snap, did he go there? It was against the law to speak out against it. Here's why, here's, and, and this is fascinating to me. Have you ever thought about this? I think every black person in the United States of America should be offended when the homosexual movement tries to take the word discrimination and use it as a way to further their cause. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't hate homosexuals. 
The scripture says, speak the truth in love. I don't hate homosexuals, but the reality is this. The reality is this. If you are forcing people to go along with it and silencing the voices that speak out against it, people will never have the ability to come to their own conclusions. Right? Like, if, if I believe something, I can believe it all by myself. And if I can't believe something all by myself, maybe, maybe it's because I don't really believe it. Are y'all tracking? Are y'all tracking? And, 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 I'm, and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying we should be mean to people who are homosexuals any more than we should be mean to people who are harlots or mean to people who are drunks or mean to people who are drug addicts. I'm just saying it's okay. It's not evil. You're, you don't hate somebody just because you think that is wrong. Like, and I know there's a danger. Y'all might not ever see me on YouTube again. I get it. Y'all might not ever see me on Facebook again. But I, I, I'm not running. I'm not in a popularity contest. Like, I am... All I'm saying is one of the reasons we have we have a situation now in many states in the United States of America where boys can go into the girls locker room and change clothes and declare that they identify as a girl is a very dangerous situation for our daughters to be in. Because every boy, there are some boys who when they find that out, they say, well, you, you mean all I got to do to go in the girls bathroom and look at some naked and go in the girls locker room, and look at some naked girls is declare that I'm a woman. That's insane. Like, like. You don't have to be the genius to figure out that's ridiculous. All you have to do is have a daughter and care about her at all. Anyway, you say, why did you get off on that? Because you can only have peace if you're willing to have war. I'm not going to let somebody, do you realize if they silence, if a person has a right to be a homosexual, that's, that's not my point. They have that right. They should not have the right to tell me that I can't teach my children that it's wrong. Anyway, that was free. So Abraham, <laughs> he, jo- he got all of the soldiers that were born in his house. I mean, not all the soldiers, all the ser- servants that were born in his house, 318 of them, they went out and waged war against five nations. That's a level of confidence that's hard to find. They waged war against five nations. Speaking of free, spe- free speech, I might as well go ahead and go there too. So everybody's all up in arms over Roe versus Way being overturned. It should have been overturned the day it was turned. Anyway, um, but I should have a right to my own body. Here's what's fascinating. The very same people that want to have a right to kill their unborn child as a license for sex without responsibility, those very same people will argue that you should be, the government should be able to make other people wear a mask and get a shot that's not even been proven that it is a vaccine and I won't even go into the rest of it. It's, it's like liberalism is a self-perpetuating contradiction. It will always come to the place where it contradicts itself. It can't help it. Why? It doesn't have a foundation. Anyway, that was free too. Okay, so, so we have to, like those of you who believe something, don't allow the voices of evil to be the only ones speaking in the ears of your children. So now that we brought that up, um, so chapter 15, this is, this is chapter, chapter 15 is chapter 15 is where, is where God doesn't like God promised Abram in Genesis chapter 12. God entered a covenant with Abram in Genesis chapter 15. We're going to read it. So I, all of that was introduction. <laughs> All of that was introduction, okay? It says, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I am thy shield. What does that mean? I'm your protection. I'm your exceeding great reward. What is that? It is, that means I am your provision. So I'm your protection and I'm your provision. Y'all tracking? Okay. And Abram said, uh, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of mine house is this Eliezer of Damascus? So Abram realized something. Here's what Abram realized. Abram realized that wealth was not enough to fulfill you, because he had the wealth. Abram understood that power was not enough to fulfill you. He had the power. He had enough power to go to war against five nations and win. That's a lot of power. But see, God created man in his own image. 
And because he created man in his own image, and the first thing God tells about God is that he's creative, that means he created us to create stuff. But God didn't just create stuff. God didn't just create, God created three categories in creation. This is so good. It's like, God created three categories in creation. He created creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the water, the grass, the trees, the rocks, etc. He created creatures, the dogs, the cats, the alligators, the giraffes, and the chimpanzees. And then he created creators, human beings. Why did God create creators? Well, God, like the creation, creation and creatures were an expression of God's creativity. But when God created creators, he created that as an extension of his connection. God created someone he could connect with when he created man. And when I say man, I'm talking about men and women, because God called their name Adam, which means man. Later, Adam called her name Eve. So when God created man in his own image, he created us for connection. And everything that God made was good until he got to Adam and he said, it's not good, lotov, for man to be alone. Oh, what does that mean? That means man, because he's created my image, just like I wanted connection with him, he needs somebody to have connection with. So God created Eve, put Adam to sleep, took Eve, took a rib out of Adam's side, made Eve. And then he called her woman because she was taken out of the man. And and what's amazing about that whole story is now Adam feels more fulfilled. Why? Because not only can he create now, but he can also, like Adam named all the animals. That was, he used his creativity to create, name all the animals. So God created all the animals. Adam used his creativity to name all the animals, right? And so now Adam's got connection with this woman. And when they come together, they have the ability to physically create another human. It's, this whole thing is so beautiful and so powerful when we really understand what's going on in the background and what God is doing. But watch what happens next. We're not even completely fulfilled when we have creation and connection. There's one more element we need, and that is when man sinned, God sent his son to die on the cross for our sin. He gave a contribution. And so the things that we need to feel fulfilled are creation. Do you understand it's our our creative power that creates our wealth, and it's what creates, it's what establishes us, and it's what gives us, even in some instances, the power but it doesn't fulfill us. And then it gives, so we got the wealth and we got the power, but now I I need somebody to enjoy it with, right? So I need a community. I need a spouse. I need some children. I need a family. I need a community. I need need some people that I can engage with and share ideas with and connect with and talk to and hug and love and touch. We all need connection, but then we have to have contribution. And then when we have contribution, then when we're giving, so we contribute back to God because he contributed to us, right? Right? Um, the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if, one, that if one died for all, then they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, right? So I should be living for him. Why? Because he died for me. Are, are y'all tracking? So that my contra- that's my contribution. Yielding to God is my contribution back to God. And then I want to contribute to society. I want to contribute to my family. I want to contribute to my wife. I want to contribute to my children and my grandchildren and my community and my brothers and my family and my neighborhood. I want to contribute to society as a whole. Why? Because that's the only way to feel fulfilled. People, my, I have all this money, but I'm not fulfilled. I know because you only have creation and you have no connection and you have no contribution. Anyway, I, that, was, that was a long rant. Man, I don't know why it takes me so long to get into what I'm actually going to say. Um, but... So Abram said, Lord, what will you give me? See, see, he said, I've got the money, I've got the power, and you said you're my shield and my exceeding great reward, but what are you going to give me as a token to prove to me that you're, what you're telling me is true? That's what he's asking him. He's saying, Lord, I, I heard you and I believe you, but can you prove it? Right? What will you give me, seeing I go childless, and this Eli- the steward of mine house is Eliezer of Damascus? Why is he saying this? Because now he's 85 years old, and God promised him 10 years ago he was going to have a son, and he still doesn't have a son. Are y'all tracking? And then it says, um, and then Abram said in verse 3, And Abram said, Behold, lo, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. You're not going to give everything that I blessed you with to Eleazar. That's not how it's going to work. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and he said, Look now towards heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. If you can't count the stars, you won't be able to count your seed. I know you're 85, you don't have any children, but I'm telling you, your descendants are going to be more in number than the stars in the sky. Do you understand how hard that is to believe when you're 85 years old? Okay. So then it says, 
Um, and he believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted to him for righteousness. Hmm, it's amazing how that same theme is all the way through Scripture, right? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that, that faith is not even of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? So, he believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. In other words, I brought you out of where I brought you out of so I could give you what I'm going to give you because I couldn't give it to you there. Because if I gave it to you there, you might not appreciate it fully. If I gave it to you there, people who are there are not going to acknowledge who I'm making you into. They're going to want to remind you of who you were. Okay, y'all tracking. And he said, I brought thee out to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Oh, he's like, okay, I heard you now, but Lord, what you, how do I know that what you're telling me is true? And here's what he said. Um, he said, take me an heifer three years old, a she-goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all of these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not. And the fowls came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now, I, 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 did through, went through all of that. I'm going to come back to that story in a minute. I want to show you something on my whiteboard. So I said you can't be trusted. Why did, why, did, why did I put that on the thumbnail? Because a lot of people have asked me, Myron, how do you have confidence? Like most people are like, ah, I wish I could be more confident. I wish I had more confidence. Well, what's the root word of the word confidence? What is it? Confide, right? Confide is the root word. Con is just the prefix of confide. Confide. So what does confide mean? Confide means to, you confide in somebody, you trust them. Oh, when people don't have confidence, so somebody's not being trusted here. Now watch what happens. Confidence is trust. Now, why don't, who do, when somebody doesn't have confidence, who is it that they don't trust? They don't trust themselves. Oh, snap. What just happened? Why don't people trust themselves? I don't know if y'all can handle it. I hope y'all can handle it. Here's why. Because you're the only person who's heard every lie you've ever told. Oh, snap. I, he, he, he did not go there. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Hey, watch this. Now. You heard every lie you've ever told. Here's why you don't have confidence. Because you've let yourself off the hook so many times in the past, you can't believe a word you say. What? What just happened? What, 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 what just happened? You, you said, well, I'm going to go on a diet. And you did. Until you saw your favorite dessert. You said, well, you know, diets are overrated anyway. And plus, I heard somebody say they don't work. <laughs> right? I'm going to get in shape. And you start working out until it starts hurting. Right? I'm going to build a business. And you start working on that business until it becomes hard. You have to pull an all-nighter, and you have a cantankerous customer, right? And we let ourselves off the hook over and over and over and over again because we make choices and not decisions, and so we don't trust ourselves. Mm, I wish I had some help in here. Okay, so, so, I mean, wrap your mind around this. The thing that is going to give you Confidence is to stop making choices and start making decisions. You have to decide. Don't choose, decide. Say, Myron, don't they mean the same thing? Oh, oh, no, baby, no, 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 baby. No, 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 slow down, slow down. No, they don't mean the same thing. See, choose means to pick one. Decide comes from the Latin root de, which means of or from. Side means to cut. So when you make a choice, you pick one. When you decide, you cut yourself off from any other possibility than the one you've decided on. This is why people don't have confidence, because they don't make decisions, they make choices. Now watch what happens. Because I don't trust me, because I've broken my word to myself so many times in the past, I said I'm gonna stop cussing. Right? I, I didn't say I'm gonna stop cussing, I stopped cussing a long time ago. But I'm just, I'm just I'm helping y'all. 
I said, I'm going to stop cussing. But every now and then, I just, you know, I can't help it. One slips out. Well, then you, that's why you don't trust yourself. Yeah, I'm going to work on my business every day this week. And you work on it a day and a half and you're like, you know, this is, nobody bought anything. I'm tired. And you break your word to yourself again and then again and then again and then again. I'm going to be kind to my wife. I'm going to be kind to my husband. I'm going to be more loving and spend more time with my children. And then you don't do it. And you break your word to yourself over and over and over again. And now you don't believe anything you say. Now watch what happens next. The scripture says, and I'm not sure exactly where this verse is. So, Laura, you might want to look this one up for me, sister. So it says, as in water, face answereth to face. So doth the heart of a man to a man. When you look in some water, you see a reflection of your face. So when somebody looks in your face, like when you look in somebody's face, you are reflecting how you see yourself to that person's heart. They're picking up your vibe. I learned this a long time ago. Now, I had polio as an infant. I walk with a limp. But when people think of me, they don't think of Myron Golden. The poor guy had polio, walks with a limp. Nobody thinks of me that way. Why? Because I don't think of me that way. People don't see you through their eyes. They see you through your eyes. And if you want people to start looking at you differently, start looking at yourself differently. But Myron, I don't know how to do that. Well, let me tell you how. Start looking at yourself the way God looks at you. Instead of just making something up. You are not who your mom and them told you you were. You're not who your brother told you. You're not who the kids you grew up with told you you were. You're not who your boss told you you were. And you're not who, uh, you're not who uh, your, um, your, your, um, your, your friends told you or your enemies told you you were. You're not who the television told you you were. You're not who the media told you you were. You're not who Instagram and Facebook and YouTube told you you were. You are who God tells you you are. And in fact, when other people are telling you who you are, they're really not telling you who you are anyway. What are they telling? They're telling you who you aren't. So if you start focusing on who God says you are instead of the who the world, the flesh, and the devil say you aren't, maybe you'll have more confidence. Am I talking too fast? Because sometimes I talk fast. Do I need to pump the brakes? And what we've got to do is we've got to understand, hey, you, you, know how, you know why I can love me? I can love me because I don't have a higher standard than God, and he loves me. Now, if if God loves you and you don't love you, do you realize you are literally saying that your standard is higher than God's? What? That's cray-cray. Baby, Ray Ray, nay-nay, cray-cray, y'all. That's cray-cray. That don't make no sense. Hey, God loves you. God forgave you, but I just can't forgive myself. I just, I don't know. I just don't like me. I just wish that. What is that? You mean you're siding with the enemy on who you're not instead of on, with God on who you are? What is that? See, I, I, I can tell you one thing. I am, I'm confused about some things, but I am not confused about who I am because I know who I am based on whose I am. And I, I decided a long, 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 long time ago, if you don't like me, I ain't the problem. <laughs> Oh, this is helping somebody I know. So you say, Myron, what does this have to do with that story of Abraham? Y'all saw what he did, didn't y'all? We're talking about a man who had, who, who's, whose name was the source of his shame. We're talking about a man who's called the high father, but he couldn't have any children. We're talking about a man, but you know what he had? He had a nephew. He said, I might not have a son yet, but I got a nephew. And y'all think y'all getting him. Y'all don't even know who y'all dealing with. Go get your swords. Let's go. He had enough confidence to wage war against five nations, and we don't have enough, we don't have enough gumption to just stand up and tell the truth in a public place because we're afraid of what everybody might think. You know why we're afraid of what everybody might think? Because most people are all thinking the same thing, which means none of them are thinking. Well, let me show you here. I want to finish this story. We're going to tie it all together, and then I'm going to be like Pharaoh and let God's people go. <laughs> okay. So we're going to finish this story. Watch what happened next. So it says, it says um, in verse number, um, verse number 10, he took and divided them in his midst. He laid one piece against another, and the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abram drove them away. Drove them away. Now watch what it says next in verse 12. And when the sun was going down, and it was dark, behold, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto him, he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be, afflict, shall be a stranger in a land that's not theirs. They shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. 
also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. It seems to be a theme, doesn't it? God, when he brings you out, he gives you great substance. That seems to be a theme. Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't the only one who saw that. Uh, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good, a good old age. The fourth generation, uh, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So, what does this have to do with anything? So, you'll notice that it said, it said, um, the sun went down, it was dark, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And Abram, uh, and he said unto Abram, know of surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that's not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. So, I want you to see how this works. God is getting ready to enter a covenant with Abram, okay? Am I still on screen? Am I good? Okay, so, so God's getting ready to enter a covenant with Abram. So you got to understand what a covenant is. The, a covenant is not a contract. A covenant is the opposite of a contract. A contract is an agreement between two or more individuals based upon a mutual distrust. So Kenan, I trust you, but I, I need help, some help. So can you come help me do with this illustration, brother? Okay, so... Just stand right here for me, if you will. Be so kind, sir. Okay, so, so if Keenan and I, we enter a business deal, and we shake hands on a business deal, and I, you sign on the dotted line, I sign on, a, sign on the dotted line, so you go ahead and sign on your dotted line. Okay, so we sign our contract. The reason we did that is because I'm saying to Keenan, now, if you don't give me what you told me you're going to give me, I'm going to go get a lawyer, and they're going to make you give it to me. He's saying to me, if I don't give him what I told him I'm going to give him, he can take it to a lawyer and make me give it to him. That's, what, that's the purpose of a contract. A contract is an agreement between two or more individuals based upon a mutual distrust. Upon, not upon. Upon a mutual distrust. Are y'all tracking? A covenant is the opposite of that. A covenant is an agreement between two or more individuals based upon a mutual love and trust. So if two people were getting ready to enter into the covenant, start on that side over there, bro. Just stand over there, okay? I'm going to stand over here. So when two people got ready to come into covenant, they would bring an animal, right? So you walk towards me, I'm going to walk towards you. So we're both leading our animal. So Kenan's going to turn around, turn around. Now take your, your knife in your right hand and kill your animal, kill it, and then cut it in pieces, and then put it in a pile right in front of you, okay? So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn around, I'm going to kill my animal, cut it in pieces, put it in a pile. Why are we cutting the animal? Because the word covenant means to cut, are y'all tracking? To covenant means to cut. So then we're getting ready to enter in a covenant. Now understand, now God's getting ready to enter a covenant with Abraham. I'm going to do men first. I'm going to do a covenant with two men first. Because oh, two men, me and Kenan. Okay, so Kenan, when I say go, walk around your animal really slowly, looking at the animal, taking in the brutality of the death of that animal, seeing the mutilated body parts. I mean, just see it, like feel it. You ready? So walk around, go. Really slowly. He's walking around his, I'm walking around mine. We're going to come back in the middle face to face this time. Right? So we come back in the middle, we're face to face. So we both took in the brutality of the death of the animal that, we, that grew up in our family, like it was our animal. Right? Now we take, I take a knife in my left hand, you take a knife in your left hand, we cut our right hand, just like that. We put our hands together, we bind our hands together with a rope. By the way, the cut in our hands form a cross, which is in Paleo-Hebrew, which is ancient Hebrew, is the sign for a covenant. Okay, so anyway, so, so now, now what happens is his blood becomes my blood, my blood becomes his blood, and we become covenant brothers. And then we exchange covenant vows. So I say, Keenan, I'm going to give everything I have. I'm going to give my time. I'm going to give my wealth. I'm going to give my resource. I'm going to give my energy. I'm going to give my thought power. I'll even give my very life if necessary to protect you and yours. Vice versa. Right. Okay, well, you'll do that in a minute. So, but if you don't, if I don't keep my word to you, this is what a covenant is. If I don't keep my word to you, may what happened to that animal happen to me. That's the power of a covenant. A covenant is a promise of love that you swear on your life. Are y'all tracking? This is going to be so good. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit longer than I thought. Okay. So, and then he says the same thing to me. Point at your animal. If he doesn't keep his word to me, may what happened to that animal happen to him, right? So we are, we are, now we become covenant brothers. There's a saying in the East that blood is thicker than milk. What does that mean? That means if two people enter into covenant together, they are closer in relationship than two sons who were nursed by the same mother. That's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. So now when you read the story of the covenant with David and Jonathan, you understand it a little bit better. I would, in, in other words, I would rather die in honor keeping my word to you than live in dishonor and break my word to you. That's a covenant. Are y'all tracking? Okay, so here's what's cool. God gets ready to enter a covenant with Abram. Well, God's a spirit, so he doesn't have any animals to bring, so he just tells Adam, he already owns all the animals anyway, so he just tells a Abram to bring all the animals. Okay, Abram, you kill the animals, you cut them up in pieces. You do that part. You do the physical stuff. Now, Abram's getting ready to enter a covenant with God. Abram's got two problems. He's in double jeopardy. 
What's the problem he has? Problem number one, no man has seen God at any time and lived. Right. He's going to be face to face with God in a covenant relationship. He's going to have to die. Right. But not only that, Abram can't even keep the covenant because he's a human. He's got sin in his blood. Right. He can't keep the covenant, so he's going to have to die. So now he's got two reasons he's going to have to die. So here's what God says. God says, uh, you know what? Um, I'm going to put you to sleep. You can just go to sleep in that chair right there. I'm going to move it over here closer so everybody can see you sleep. Like, now you got to look like you sleep now, bro. Okay, so God put Abram to sleep. God put Abram to sleep. Now, right there? Okay, so God put Abram to sleep. Now watch what happens next. This is so good. When the sun went down, it was lark, uh, dark. Behold, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Why? Do you, do you remember anybody else God put to sleep? Adam. Why did, when did God put Adam to sleep? take out his rib. There's that covenant. There's that cut. That's why marriage is a covenant. Are y'all tracking? You, are y'all seeing the beauty of this? Okay. This is why, by the way, in the Old Testament, when somebody committed adultery, they didn't call it an affair. They called it adultery. And guess what happened? They called it adultery. And if you got caught committing adultery, you were taken outside the camp and stoned. Why? Because you broke covenant and you already swore in your life to keep your covenant. Are y'all tracking? Okay. So it says he put him to sleep, right? So God did the same thing to Abram when he entered into covenant with Abram that he did to to Adam when he had Adam enter a covenant with Eve. Okay, now, they had that holy anesthesia, right? Worse, way better than ether. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so now here's, what's, here's what else is interesting. God put Abram to sleep, and while Abram's asleep, God starts giving him a dissertation. Abram can't even hear him. Now, Abram's asleep over here, and here's what it says. Uh, it says, and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be in a stranger in a land that's not theirs. They shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. No, Abram's order. Right? He can't even hear him. What is this? Why are you talking to a man that's asleep? And then it says, it says, it says, also that nation whom they shall serve, I'll judge. And afterwards, I'll bring them out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abram missed the whole thing. This is worse than sleeping in church. This is sleep while God's talking to you. Right? Now, now, now watch this. What is God showing us? Here's what God's showing us. He does not keep his word to us because we know what he says. He keeps his word to us because he knows what he said. I hope you are tracking. Okay. And then it says, it says um, in verse 17, oh, then verse 16, the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fallen. Now watch what it says next. This is so good. It says, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, you know what behold means? Hey, look, check this out. A smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Those pieces of what? Those pieces of animal carcass. So Larry, come on over here. Here's the problem. No, stand over there. Abram couldn't keep the covenant. So God had to put him to sleep. Guess what Abram needed? Abram needed a substitute. Abram needs somebody to take his place in that covenant who could be face to face with God and not die. Abram needed somebody in that covenant who could keep covenant, even though Abram's going to keep break covenant. Abram needed somebody who, if Abram broke covenant, was willing to die the death of that dead animal because Abram broke covenant. Okay, so now God's getting ready to enter a covenant with Abram, but Abram can't do it. Why? Because he can't keep the covenant. So it comes to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, a smoking furnace is a type of God the Father. Do you all remember what it says about God coming down and descending on Mount Sinai? What happened? The smoke ascended like what? A great furnace. Burning lamp. Burning lamp? I remember hearing something about a burning lamp. Burning lamp, burning lamp. Where was that? Oh, yeah. Jesus, when he healed the blind man in John chapter 9, he said, I am the light of the world. That word light is lamp. The burning lamp is a, an Old Testament, it's a type of Christ. So now, instead of Abram walking that covenant with God, the smoking furnace, type of God the Father, the burning lamp, type of God the Son, they walk around, go ahead, walk around, walk around, just like he did, yep, come back in the middle, face to face. And they, they enter the covenant, they put their hand, yeah, the other hand, the other hand, yep. They put their hands together, now watch what happens. The father's saying, well, the son, the, the burning lamp is saying, if Abram doesn't keep covenant with you, may what happened to that animal happen to me. This is why it says in Isaiah, 
His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. This is why Christ had to die, not just a death, but a brutal death. Because it's part of the covenant. But when he... When, when this burning lamp is standing here, he's not just taking Abram's place. He's taking your place, and he's taking my place. He's taking our place. For God, for, 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 for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, sin for us. He, God, hath made him, Jesus, sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Or you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich in righteousness, yet for your sakes he became poor, he became sin, that ye through his poverty might be rich. This is so good. Do y'all see how good this is? So, The smoking furnace enters the covenant with Abram, with Abram's substitute on Abram's behalf. And the smoking, the burning lamp says, if Abram doesn't keep comfort, what what happened to that animal happened to me. Now, watch this now. Do you remember how, how, who God refers to himself as? He is the God who cannot, what? Lie. It didn't say he does not lie. It didn't say he will not lie. It says he cannot lie. Well, why can't he lie? Because his covenant, his word is his covenant. His word is his bond. His word means something to him. And if he doesn't keep the promise he made to Abram, I'm going to bless you in ways you can't bless yourself. I'm going to make you something you can't make yourself. I'm going to take the source of your shame and turn it into the source of your fame. I'm going to take the source of your pain and turn it into the source of your power. I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. And in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. If he didn't keep his word to Abram, what happened to that animal would have to happen to God. And if God dies, watch this now, everything ceases to exist. So God cannot lie because the existence of everything, including him, depends upon him keeping his word. So that's why I have confidence, because I know what he said. Do you understand? The more you know and understand the word of God, the more confidence you will have. The more you know about what God's word says about any situation, the more confidence you'll have in that situation. All right, give these two guys a hand. Thanks, guys. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate you. It's time to wake up, Abram. Okay, now, one last thing, and this is truly the last thing. Because I've got, a, I've got a training that starts in 13 minutes. But I, we, ain't, we, we ain't dropping off right here. We're going to do this. So the Hebrew word for truth is the word, it's the word amet. Sounds like what? Amen, right? Which means so be it. So the Hebrew word for truth is amet. This letter here, Allah, represents God. Mem tav, if you, like mem is the might of the ocean, mighty. The ocean, a tab is a cross or a covenant. The word for truth is God's mighty covenant. What is, the, what, is the, what is God's mighty covenant? He is the God who cannot lie because if he's lying, he's dying. Oh, it gets more better. Do you realize if you separate God from the truth, if you take the Aleph away from the Mem Tav, if you just take Mem and Tav in Hebrew, this is Hebrew, y'all. Hebrew, and Hebrew words are built, they're not just spelled, right? The, the word met would be spelled in Hebrew, it would be spelled M E. I mean, in English, it would be spelled M-E-T-H. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that word from somewhere in the Bible? It was a man. He lived longer than everybody else. What was his name? Methuselah. Methuselah's name means his death shall bring. What did his death bring? His death brought the flood. Right? Well, guess what Memtab means? It's the word for death. What do we learn from that? If you separate God from the truth, all you have left is death. But if God himself doesn't keep his word, then God himself has to die. This is What? Hebrew letters, by the way, I'm going to do this really quickly, I promise. Hebrew letters are also numbers. Aleph represents the number one. Mem represents the number 40. Tav represents the number 400. You can count from one. It's 22 letters in Hebrew, Aleph, Bet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalai, Vav, Zion. Anyway, and you you can count from one to 400 with 22 letters because you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. 200, 300, 400. You can count to 400 with these letters. Well, this is 400. 41. That's the number for truth, 441. But if you add 4 plus 4 plus 1 equals 9. 9 is the number for truth. This is so significant. But some people will say, why is it significant? Like, God is a master of detail, and he loves detail. Watch this. 9 is the number for truth. Why is 9 the number for truth? Because all of the other numbers have to answer to 9. What do I mean? Well, 9 times 1 equals 9. 9 times 2 equals 18. 9 times 3 equals 27. 9 times 4 equals 36. We'll do one more. 9 times 5 equals 45. This is learning. 1 plus 8 equals 9. 2 plus 7 equals 9. 
3 plus 6 equals 9. 4 plus 5 equals 9. Do you understand this is the only number that that works with? Today's date is 6, 29, 22, right? 6 plus 2 is 8, plus 9 is 17, plus 2 is 19, plus 2 is 21. 2 plus 1 is 3. 21 minus 3 equals 18. 1 plus 8 equals 9. I could do, it doesn't matter if it's your license plate, if it's your birthday, if it's the speed limit, speed limit's 55, oh, the speed limit's 55. 5 plus 5 is 10. 5 plus 5 is 10. 55 minus 10 equals 45. 4 plus 5 equals 9. You say, why did you do all that? It's not a trick. God designed everything. All of the other numbers have to always resolve to 9. What is God showing us in this simple mathematical illustration? Oh, let me get back over here. What is God showing us in the simple mathematical illustration? Here's what he showing us. At the end of the day, you're stuck with the truth. So you might as well start with the truth. You might as well stay with the truth. Because when it's all over, you're going to be stuck with the truth. And I didn't say you're going to be stuck with your truth. Because there's no such thing as your truth. And there's no such thing as my truth and his truth and her truth. There's only the truth, and anything that's not the truth is a lie. So don't fall for this modern-day gobbledygook, his truth, her truth, follow your truth, and all that garbage. It's not even real. There's only the truth. And anything that's not the truth is a lie. God's word can always be trusted. You want to be trusted? Follow God's word. Become a person of God's word, and then become a person of your word, and then you'll start thinking of yourself as a person of honor, who hasn't broken your word to yourself so many times you can't trust yourself, but you've kept your word to yourself so many times that you can trust yourself, and then you also will be able to be trusted because now when you say something, just like God's word is his covenant, when you make your word a covenant, and if I say I'm going to do something, you do it, instead of letting yourself off the hook, you will trust yourself more and you will cause other people to trust you more. Hope this blesses you. Stay blessed by the best, my people, and by the grace of God, we'll look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday. Bye for now.